Good afternoon. Welcome to the third and final open forum session. It's good to be back with you today. Yesterday, we received 44 questions and recommendations. You asked about the verification process, Parent PLUS loans, and the college scorecard. As I shared with you yesterday, we plan to provide responses to all open forum unanswered questions on the conference website within 30 days. I am pleased to once again introduce our panel of subject matter experts. Starting from my far left, Misty Parkinson, FSA Customer Engagement. <laughs> Greg Munyer, FSA Policy Liaison and Implementation. <laughs> Cynthia Hammond, FSA Policy Liaison and Implementation. Anne-Marie Wiseman, Department, Office of Post-Secondary Education. <laughs> Greg Martin, Department, Office of Post-Secondary Education. <laughs> Pam Eliadis, FSA Business Operations. <laughs> and last again, but not least, Ingrid Valentine, FSA Program Compliance. Before we get started, there's a clarification that we need to make, and I'm going to kick it over to uh, Cynthia to uh, clarify a question from yesterday. Thank you, Joe. So yesterday I was asked a question about foreign gift reporting and how tuition payments would be handled if you had multiple students from the same country. And throughout the course of the day, I've had people ask me various questions um, to clarify that. And I just wanted to let you guys know, I'm going to go back to the department and um, have another discussion with our policy folks there and with our general counsel's office and see if we can get you a more, more clarity in that answer. So I wanted to let you know that we are going to take that back. And now I'd like to pass it over to Greg. <laughs> All right. Unlike Cynthia's, mine's an out-and-out -out mistake. So, um, <laughs> uh, so in the last session of cash management, uh, on cash management that David Musser and I presented, we got a question related to prior year charges. And as you're probably aware, uh, you're allowed to use up to $200 of current uh, current year Title IV funds to, to, to pay, uh, or use current Title IV funds to pay for up to $200 of prior year charges. And I just want to clarify that in order to apply that $200 to prior year charges, if, if, the, if what you're applying it to is tuition and fees, you do not, I repeat, do not need a student authorization to do that. Uh, where you would need a student authorization is for educationally related goods and services provided by the school for which you're uh, for which you're required to obtain an authorization. That would be, for instance, um, crediting the student's account for uh, books and supplies that are not institutional charges, like bookstore costs. And if you've already obtained the student's authorization to do that for current year charges, you're not required to retain a redundant authorization for prior year charges. So in most cases, you will already have obtained that. So for, for all practical reasons, you do not need another uh, student authorization for that. Just want to clarify that. Thank you, and we're sorry for the error. Okay, let's get started. Mike two, sir. There are two types of extended repayment, also two types of graduated repayment. One does not require consolidation and involves $30,000 or more in federal student loan debt uh, and gives you 25 year repayment. The other requires consolidation and has a series of different uh, minimum debt levels to get a number of years. For example, $20,000 or more gets you 20 years, $60,000 or more gets you 30 years. And to the best of my knowledge, this has not been repealed by Congress and the department hasn't issued any guidance uh, ending the second program. Yet on studentaid.ed.gov, under the list of repayment plans, there is no mention of the second set and their calculators do not calculate for the second set. There is a very brief mention uh, in an obscure location of the second type of extended repayment. And I'm wondering why the department has chosen to hide information on a legally available option to the borrowers. Okay. Then I also have uh, an additional comment. 
Um, with regard to the income-driven repayment plans, if a borrower is eligible for pays during repayment, it is clearly superior in almost every circumstance to the other repayment plans. If the borrower is not uh, eligible for pays during repayment, it's a toss-up between revised pays during repayment and income-based repayment, because uh, income-based repayment has a cap at standard repayment, repay does not. Income-based repayment allows you, if you file married filing separately, to base it on the borrower's own income, repay does not. And there's also a, a distinction if the borrower expects to get, go to graduate school, that affects the repay program. Yet there are signs that the department is routinely steering borrowers into the repay program without doing a case-by-case -case analysis of whether IBR or repay is better for that borrower's specific circumstances. I myself have called the Federal Student Aid Information Center and asked questions designed to test this, and in every circumstance, I've been steered into a repayment plan that is less expensive for the federal government, but more expensive for the borrower. And then there's a question I asked uh, that Jeff said he would take back, and there was never an answer. And that's if you have a borrower's parents are divorced, uh, and each of those parents has remarried, and all four parents are living together, which parent is responsible for completing the FAFSA? I had an idea of which one I would say, but I want an official confirmation. Jeff said he would take it back and get me an answer, but then he retired. So I'm now putting that question to you. <laughs> So thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you giving us your comments and suggestions. Um, unfortunately, I'm giving you the same answer Jeff Baker did, which is we will have to take that back. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> so Mark, I've just, I've just got to ask, is this a real case or is this a hypothetical? It's a real case. I also have one involving same-sex parents who got married, then got divorced, but are living together, which I'm pretty certain it's the only the, the, that's the one situation in which same-sex marriage is treated differently than a biological marriage because okay. the student has a biological relationship or an adoptive relationship with both parents, but in the same-sex marriage case, only one parent is a biological or unless that both parents adopted that child. Okay. Thank you. I collect these cases just for you. <laughs> Thank you for those questions. Uh, sticking with Mike too, sir. Hi, Chris Freeman from Noman. Um, the end of our fiscal year is the end of this month, so I've got 26 days to figure this out. Before I came, I uh, scheduled our, our compliance audit, and uh, I had a discussion with the, uh, with the person at the other end of the phone saying, uh, you're going to need to come up with some uh, items for the new required procedure or the, the required procedures of uh, verifying that the institution has designated an individual, all that, um, let's see, what is it, it's the, uh, uh, the Graham Leach Bliley Act information. So we have all of the, the we have the person, we have, we've been doing all the functions and everything, but what is it that the auditor is going to be asking for? Do you have any guidance for that? Because when I said, well, what are you going to be looking for when, when you get here? Uh, the answer was, well, we don't know. But if you don't have it, it's going to be a finding. So I think that's mine. OK. Um, so did you happen to go to that wonderful session that IG sponsored with the, um, the audit session? So, the, so a similar question came up, and the, and the answer was the same. Oh. They're looking for those three items. Right. But right. Is, what are the, like it says, verify that the institution has designated an individual to coordinate the information. Correct. Security. Is that just mean, here, here's the person. You're going to be introduced to that person. Um, or or that you're going to really? have the contact information for that person. Right. Right? Yeah. Okay. You're going to have the name and contact information, what they do on your campus. Okay. 
What about the uh, performed a risk assessment? Should any of that stuff be in our policies and procedures? Maybe? It should be in your policies and procedures. That's a good place to put it. Okay. Yes. All right. right. Hasn't the, been there before because it's IT, so I don't usually deal with that. So right. Put it in there. But it's, right. now, it's now required. I'm sorry. It's now required to be in the policies well, and procedures? Well, that's maybe? one place where we're going to look for it. Okay. All right. Does that Everybody help? Everybody get that? <laughs> <laughs> Mike one, sir. Peter Hurley, my views are my own. <clears throat> when Secretary DeVos talks about bad paper, who is she fooling? I mean, there's no such thing as bad paper, right? And it's really no different than it was under the Guaranteed Student Loan Program, or FFEL. There are loans that don't perform, and the lenders sold them back to the government to collect and you all will garnish Social Security. So until you're dead, you're not off the hook. So what is bad paper? And, write this down, can we nominate Mark to head up the new agency that's gonna run the student loan programs? <laughs> One last thing since I'm vomiting. Um, Why are we going to student record level data with SULA, I'm sorry, with uh, enrollment reporting when gainful employment is no more? So I think I can take that last question at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the, the department needs to know student level information for a whole variety of purposes, including analysis, and also to make sure that the right students are getting the right amount of funds. So as of right now, it's not just about gainful employment, and you don't have to do the gainful employment reporting anymore if you have early implemented your gainful employment regulations by having a document that is signed by someone in authority at your school and dated. But that's an aside. Um, but it's not just getting the student level data by program isn't just about 150%. That was one reason that we implemented it, but it also feeds the scorecard. It also feeds analysis of the loan portfolio. It also feeds so many other things to figure out. And also, one of the things we learned both through gainful employment and through enrollment reporting by program level is there are some schools that were giving Title IV aid for non-approved programs. So this is about program integrity as well as about making sure that the right students are getting the right amount of money and data analysis. Does the department plan to do any disclosures to the student to let them know that this information is being collected on them? Yeah, we, we do do that. Oh, okay, thank you. So I wanted to backtrack to your first part of the question. Bad paper. Uh, bad paper is essentially any time we can't collect on the loan. So yes, we have tools like social security offset. But if that amount that they're receiving isn't enough to satisfy the debt, um, if we can't locate someone, they left the country, they're not getting Social Security for whatever reason, anytime we can't collect on the loan, we consider that to be bad paper. A suggestion. Why doesn't the government get into income sharing agreements? <laughs> So if you went to session 32, that is one of the things we are talking about experimenting on. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, uh, Mike three, ma'am. Thank you. And here, Cynthia, I'm gonna be probably your easiest question today, right? Yay. <laughs> I know, Amory. Okay, so I had, um, I have a couple questions, but I'll let others come. So my first question has to do with program review uh, requirements, like you say you have to go out and do this, please go fix this item. So I have a, a situation with a client that uh, they had put in the wrong withdrawal date in NSLDS. They're a large school, so they did it through a system. Uh, their IT department misunderstood uh, LDA versus data determination, put L, uh, data determination in on thousands of records. Great, fine, they, they found it. Uh, everybody was, yep, mea culpa, we'll fix it. Uh, tried to fix it, 
didn't do it right the first time, came in the second time, we were all excited about the uh, history update uh, option, right? Um, this school had 6,800 records they had to fix, and we found out a week before when we thought, okay, we can upload these changes, that we couldn't. And so they had to manually go in. We talked to NSLDS, uh, uh, a specialist on the new uh, functionality, and he said, you'll be better off not doing it through the upload because it'll make more problems than it will. So it's a great opportunity. They actually want to go back and have us look at all of their records, and then if they find other things that you guys didn't find, they want to fix them. But to do it on, now it'll be much more, right, because it'll be five more award years forward. So any updates on, or maybe even guidance, I think the guidance might be that you can do the upload as long as you do the change and all the other uh, data. So it kind of replaces the record. So from a technical perspe uh, perspective, rather than appending the record, you would replace the record. So maybe, see if that would, tech so, guy down front? I'm gonna so ask Valerie So why did you Shearer. think this was gonna be my easiest question I know, today? because you could give it to Pam, that's why. <laughs> I, and yeah. I'm passing it to Valerie. I know, right? <laughs> sure. We understand the issue, and we're working on a fix, and in fact, in March, it will be implemented so that you will be able to do it online. And, Okay, great. And so yes. one of the things that came up in the discussion with NSLDS was that they said, yeah, it's really hard because we can't make it that easy for you yet. We, you, know, we, you can't fix that easily in our system, but the program reviewers are asking you. They don't often know what my system can and can't do. So, so I, I don't have any problem calling the program reviewer and saying, do you really want this data? And I think you really want this data because that'll actually give you an answer. Sure. And they're always willing to take that, but they ask them to fix something that, that isn't easy to do. So, And uh, circumstances like that, you can direct them to us and we can work us with Us being uh, NSLDS. Oh, yeah, no, no, I meant, I mean, are you at NSLDS uh -huh. or are you? Oh, see, I, we called NSLDS. Well, there is our customer service line, and then there is the ED person. The, the by, behind yeah. the scenes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Sure. I'll come back. I have other questions, but right. I'll let others. Thank you. Okay. Mike, too. Ma'am. Hi. Uh, this pertains to what Cynthia, Cynthia just said uh, with regarding to early implementation. You mentioned you need to have a signed document that's dated, and we were told yesterday that all it has to be done is be placed somewhere that's visible, visible like the policy and procedure manual, that we are going to do this process. We are undertaking early implementation. We were not told anything about a document that has to be signed or dated. So if you're early implementing some of our regulations, then I'm talking about gainful employment. Right. So if you're early implementing the gainful employment regulations or any of the ones that Anne-Marie's been talking about this week. So if you're early implementing the gainful employment regulations, what you need to do to early implement it is have a, is your school needs to make the decision to do so. Someone with the authority to make that decision at your school needs to, in writing, dated and signed, say that your school is early implementing as of, you know, the date that you did this document, this letter, memo, whatever it is and you need to put it in your school records somewhere so that it is available to the department upon request. We're not gonna ask it, we don't want you to send it to us now, but that it's available later. Uh, so it's So I don't know who told you that it had to be actually in your procedures. Well, we were not told that it had to be signed or dated. That's yeah, in the original electronic announcement that um, talked about early implementation, I believe we did comment that we needed that documented and I think very, if not in that electronic announcement, the one right after did say it needed to be signed and dated. Okay, so is it enough to print up something that says we are undertaking early implementation and it's signed by, I don't know, the president of the school, it's dated, and it's put aside somewhere safe, like with yep. the e-car and all that other stuff, just in case? That's oh. right. Okay, thank you. You've clarified. Mike one. Sir? 
So I'll preface this by saying that I'm approaching this from an enrollment perspective. Uh, on the FAFSA, there's an inherently conflicting question uh, as it relates to dependent students, uh, divorce slash separated. And I was wondering if you could offer some thoughts about uh, how that relates to the parent filing status, whether it's single, head of household, et cetera, uh, for divorce slash separated, or if there would be more prudent to separate divorced and separated. I'm just trying to think through what you mean by a conflict. I think you said conflict. It, it creates inherently a, conf a conflicting situation. If you have divorced, it's okay to file single, right? But if you have separated, and not every circumstance is it okay to file single. Right. So, so you're suggesting that we break it out because of our validation between the uh, marital status and tax filing status question? Correct. Okay. We can certainly go back and take a look at that. That's not the primary purpose of the marital status question. Sure. Um, but we did add those, um, those alerts a few years ago, and that's not something that we um, talked about specifically. So we can certainly go back and have that discussion. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Mike three, sir. Hi. Um, I have a question and kind of a use case scenario for the uh, informed borrower tool. And so my question is, is why can't a student complete the tool once and have it count for two award years? And here would be a, a use case scenario. A lot of schools are quarter based or have uh, programs that start on modules, maybe four or five times during a term. And so you could have a student who is first enrolling in a spring term for one award year, and then six or seven weeks later, basically be enrolled in another award year, and yet have to complete the informed borrower uh, tool the second time, six weeks later. Uh, rather than just doing it basically when they were admitted into the school and it's going to cover two years. So would it be possible for them to basically either have a choice to cover two years or just work on a date-based versus an award-type system uh, in determining whether a, a student needs to do it more than once? Because the reality is three months from now, a student's not going to be any more informed than they were you know, the first time they did it. Uh, thank you for the suggestion. Um, they will only have to do the informed borrower tool one time in that case because it's tied to the actual loan. It can cross over another award year, but for that loan and every disbursement on that loan, they do the informed borrower tool one time for that first disbursement. Does that answer your question? Yes, if you're if you're basically at the beginning of an academic year, but if in this particular case, let's say, uh, summer is a header, so spring is the second part of one academic year, and then summer is a header for a new academic year, so that would be a new loan for a student, in which case they would have to do it again. Yes. But yet, you're really only looking, you know, maybe a couple months away from the time the student really became a student at the institution. Right. Um, yes, and, and as we move forward with this tool, we will look at different ways to um, improve it in the future. But initially, we would like to make sure that we have for each first disbursement at the beginning, uh, each first disbursement at the, in each new award year, that the borrower does go and and certify that they have done the informed borrower tool. So, but we will take back suggestions and we will continue to receive them probably over the next several months as this goes live. Sure. Thank you. Mike, two, ma'am. Hi, Jessica Nix, Cal State University, Channel Island. And I have a um, more, not a question or suggestion, but more feedback. I want to applaud the department on the guidance that was put out in the electronic announcement from April 15, 2019, about what schools should avoid when issuing financial aid offers. This has been wonderful because the number one thing is avoid calling your financial aid offer an award and avoid calling it a letter. I can't tell you how much feedback I get from my students and how easily they're confused when we say award letter because they're like, oh, I'll wait for something in the mail. They don't ever get anything in the mail. 
I just only direct loan offers. I don't have any awards. Why are you calling it an award letter? So thank you for providing that a guidance to our community. Thank you. It is, as a federal it's so nice to occasionally hear the approval of something that we've done as well. <laughs> Are any of these folks in the front, second, third row that worked on this, can you guys stand up? I don't know how many of you are here. Thank you. Mike one, ma'am. Hi, I'm Sylvia Bustard from Kent State University. Um, my question is about the FSA feedback system. Uh, we have been receiving a lot more of an increase in complaints lately, and we used to get hardly any. And what we're hearing from parents and students is that we called the 1-800 number, they told us to submit this, and I didn't even realize that that's what I was doing, submitting a complaint. So we're kind of wondering if there's like different guidance happening to the customer service reps that handle those calls, and are they being directed to the complaint system? Um, because we just haven't seen that before. And these are simple things such as a student had a loan that was adjusted because a scholarship came in. And that's something that can be easily explained by a customer service representative, I would think. Um, also, I don't remember taking this loan. That's another common one. And as you know, those requests, they require an extensive amount of documentation to come back to you with. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Um, when we get the complaints in, we usually, in the cases where we have to reach back out to the school, we try to do that. So if you don't receive, if you know that a complaint has come in and you don't receive a call or email back from us, just follow up and ask to see what's going on with that case. We do have an extremely high volume of, of cases that we're dealing with, so that may be the result of why you haven't seen something, but you should always definitely follow up. Well, we do get response back from you. Mm -hmm. um, it's more, you know, what is the guidance to the folks that are getting the calls and how are they being advised? Because what we're hearing from them is that they're being advised to submit this form, which is a, in, in essence a complaint. Oh. And we'll take that back. We, we will check with the call center to make sure that they are giving out proper guidance and we will work with that question. Thank you. Mike three, ma'am. Katie Starling, Kansas State University. Um, this question is about the Children of Fallen Heroes. Uh, I believe you said that there were 51. Um, one of those is ours, so we have one of the few. Um, but I wanted to know, as I worked with the student and thought through the whole thing, will there be any guidance or is there a definition of what, what parent it is? In this particular case, it was the student's biological father. It was no question. But it raised the question for me, what if it was a step-parent or an adoptive parent, or if she was, you know, if it wasn't a parent on the FAFSA, is there any, I mean, like I said, ours was pretty clear cut, but are there any rules or guidance? Uh, thank you, Katie. Um, no, and they're, and they're unlikely to be. be um, the, the Children of Fallen Heroes Act actually appears in Part F of the Higher Education Act under uh, expected family contribution shall be deemed zero, and as, as you know, uh, we are specifically prohibited from regulating in that area. So we we are we are very limited in what we can say about that. Which is, if you go back and read the EA, we even say that the language is what we have. So um, the parent it does define it as parent or guardian, but it leaves it up to the school to determine eligibility. So okay, Mike two, sir. Hi, Pam. Daniel Barkowitz, uh, Valencia College. Something you just said struck a chord, and I just wanted to check uh, my understanding. The informed borrower tool, you, you mentioned it's the first time for the loan. So if a student actually, in an academic year, borrows direct subsidized, then parent applies for plus is declined. Additional loan sub is offered. Does the student have to go in and do it twice, or is it the first time any staff or any direct loan for the year is dispersed? It's for, before the first disbursement. So they will not have to go back and do it if there's multiple disbursements on, or even additional loans. Great. 
Thank you. The other suggestion I would make is as we continue, I know this is the first year and this will continue to evolve and I commend you all because the announcement was made a week ago and the fact that you have the details you have, I know is, is already um, meaningful enough. I would commend the department but also suggest that maybe in the future we think about a distributed system where maybe students or schools through their own system could provide the same information and in an, in an app or, a, or maybe a, a key transmit to you that we've displayed the information to the student. Um, because the student may be more likely to see it through our system than yours and that might solve some of the state issues around loan letters as well. And we'll definitely take that back. As you know, many wonderful things are happening with our technology. Um, and as we move towards building next-gen PPO, we can think of different ways that we can provide more information to you as FAAs. Thank you. Mike Wine, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Rocky Weinger from SUNY Binghamton. Um, I had a question about um, the PJ regulations that let us uh, offer a federal unsubsidized loan to students whose parents refuse to file the FAFSA, so long as A, they're not providing any support to the student, and B, they can provide documentation on that. Um, I think it's really awesome that we have the ability to give some type of financial aid to these students, but it doesn't seem super fair necessarily that there are additional steps for them, since the only thing that's really preventing them from being eligible for this loan is the fact that they can't convince their parents to file the FAFSA. Because regardless, oh, regardless of um, a family's income, if the student can convince their parents to file the FAFSA, it doesn't matter if the parent actually plans to support or not, they'd still be eligible, assuming they meet the other Title IV eligibility requirements, they'd still be eligible at the very least for an unsubsidized loan. So why in these cases, like, for example, a student I was working with a couple weeks ago, um, they weren't receiving any support for their parents other than the fact that their parent still has them under their health insurance. So according to the regulations, they wouldn't necessarily fall into this category and we can't provide any sort of um, assistance to them. So why is that? <laughs> So the first thing I'll start with is much of this is statutory and then we repeat some of it in the regulations. Mm -hmm. Previously, the student would be essentially told the answer was no. If they couldn't get the parental data, there was no recourse for them, there was no aid available, the process stopped. So this is really an expansion of what we had before. It gives them some opportunity. That said, we are trying to protect taxpayer dollars and so we don't want to encourage people to just say, well, I don't provide support and, and I'm not going to, and so the student can obtain the unsub loan. We want to make sure there's a process in place where we have documentation to show that no support is being provided and that it won't be provided in the future, and it, it's an and, not an or, and they are not going to complete the FAFSA and, and not do the support. It's, it's both of those. So we do need to stick to the statutory requirements, to the regulatory requirements, but it, it really comes down to making sure that, that this is not used frequently. We, we don't want it to get to this. We see it as a last resort, not a first. And, and just to piggyback off of your comment, the idea of the only support provided was health insurance, we would consider that to be support. Right. So even if that's the only thing, yes, that you are correct, that is support. Mike three, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Debbie Dew from Beloit College. I'd like to get a clarification about the Graham Leach Bliley audit requirement. Our auditors this year asked us the same as the um, person that asked you the question earlier for that information. And because I'm in the financial aid department and I have nothing to do with the IT department, I had to ask IT for it and we got a finding because they didn't have anything. So my question is this, I know in the future I need to bother them to get the information, but if I have to put it in my policies, how do I even know that it's adequate? Because I don't know anything about IT. So, um, Cynthia, when it, the electronic announcement came out and mm -hmm. it has a certain, um, the requirements right. listed in there, if 
you at any time have a question about whether you're doing something right, you know you can always call the school participation division mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is brand new to me. Um, can you help me with this? I don't want to get a finding. I don't want any, you know, so just give us a call. But if you don't understand it, clearly reach out to us and we'll help you with that. No, I understood the requirement. What I'm saying is if I have to put it in my financial aid policies po and procedures, mm -hmm. how do I know that what the IT department has said is the policy and procedure is adequate? Because you know, I would get it from them. Right. And a couple years ago, I think, we did a session at the conference that was called um, Financial Aid is a Team Sport. And this is one of those cases where you're going to have to work with others at your university and sometimes rely on other people's expertise to make sure that it all, it all comes together. Because as I mentioned in the federal update, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of you who are really good at cybersecurity stuff, but there's others of us that are not. And you do have an IT fo person, and you know, it's their responsibility as well. Okay. But we do have to have it in our financial aid policies and procedures. That would be the place that we would probably go to look for it? OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike, too. Ma'am? Hello, my name is uh, Danielle Long. I work at Operation Graduate, so not a school. We work with students at a couple of different schools. Um, and one thing that we encounter a whole lot, and this happened when I did work at a school also, is that students who start in the spring, they fill out the wrong FAFSA because they're not accustomed to thinking of things in academic years. Um, so I was just wondering if it might be helpful to add, say, July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020 under 2019-2020 on the main page where they're selecting what year to fill out, because I typically have better luck when I tell them what like real dates it applies to. Yeah, I appreciate the suggestion. The problem is schools have different academic years, and with headers and trailers, they may or may not be filling out the right FAFSA. So, but perhaps you want to? Yeah. Oh, oh. Sorry, maybe this isn't what you wanted me to say, so you can follow up if it's not. But we did actually have that information. Um, and then when prior prior year came along, we had to take a look at the language on the that main page that they come to. And we got input from FAAs. Um, and we landed where we are right now. So um, that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, talk about it again and perhaps land somewhere else. But um, what we heard overwhelmingly is that um, students generally know what they're supposed which form they're supposed to be filling out and giving them like the dates and all of that other stuff is not something that they understand um, what we heard is that you know schools are directing pe uh, the students to filling out a particular form and we need to make it very clear the difference between the forms so that they're choosing the one that they were directed to complete. Now, that's not true for everybody, obviously. All schools are different. Um, you know, your four-year universities with standard terms are very different from your, your schools with, you know, uh, revolving starts and all of that other stuff. But we're trying to create an experience that works for the majority. Um, and that decision was based on the feedback we received at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe your data. You've seen it more than I have. Thank you. You're welcome. Mike, one, ma'am. Uh, hi, my name is Jessica Thompson from the Institute for College Access and Success. Um, thank you, thank you for the program level data on the scorecard. Um, I want to echo a comment yesterday that we'd love to see the mean and median in the data file. Um, one question I had is uh, that we noticed in the revamped tool, the consumer facing part of the scorecard, that the institutional level metrics in terms of debt and earnings and repayment are no longer there uh, with the new program level uh, data. And we would, you know, we do think that that is helpful information on that consumer facing tool and would prefer that that be replaced and also um, are reinstated on the tool and then allow students to drill down to the new program level uh, data. And in particular, it seemed like a reversal from the final GE notice that specified that the scorecard would indeed re retain the institution level um, debt data, median debt data in particular. So I'm just wondering if you would at all consider reinstating the institution level data on the, the tool. We actually are already considering making that update as well as some of the other updates that we've, we've heard requests for. We gathered a lot of feedback at the session from this morning 
And as you know, it's, it's a fairly new product, and so anytime it's new, we get a lot of great ideas from people. And so we are in the process of collecting those and taking them back and looking at what we can implement and when with each, with each new release. Thank so you. thank you again for the suggestions. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Mic three, sir. Hello. Whoa, that's loud. Uh, Spencer Smith, University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Uh, I had a question about Comet Code 298, the Iraq Afghanistan uh, service grant. So we've been tracking the Comet Code, and we didn't have any results, but we found people who had the DOD mag, uh, flag as yes. And I was kind of curious, is there like a time frame for when the system generates the new ICERs? Because for people for the prior academic year, we still never received a facet that had the actual comment code. Uh-oh. Oh. Marie, do you know this? Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'd just be making something up. This is the subject matter expert. Actually, hi, Marie Fitzpatrick in uh, COD Operations. But um, I think this question came up before, Misty, and I asked you about it, and you were explaining how uh, not every single one might get the common code. Can you speak to that? I can. I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't realize this was, was the same issue. I was pointing to you, and I think you thought I was pointing to Craig, but I was like, I don't think this is fine. I think this is Misty. Okay. I think we would need an example or two to be able to figure out for sure. However, um, we do have a limitation on the, the SAR as to how many comments can display. Um, and then we have all of this crazy logic that dictates like which ones are more important than others. It's possible that you're not seeing it because there are other comments um, that were triggered that we considered to be more important. And maybe there isn't enough room in order for um, that particular comment code to display. Uh, but we would need to see an example, uh, at least one example, to be able to check and see if that's the case. Um, or if perhaps there's something wrong with the system and you know we need to fix it. Um, so if you have an example um, with you, we actually have a, a table in the resource center for FAA access, and I believe we have somebody there who would be able to look it up and, and potentially be able to figure out what's going on. If not, uh, if you want to um, contact me and we can talk about how to get the identifiers, then I can have somebody look it up and we'll do a little research. Okay. Um, Misty.parkinson at ed.gov. Sweet. Uh, so we find to just go ahead and operate off of the DOD match equals Y. Is that sufficient enough? Yeah, you don't need a comment code off of SAR to do it. A COD will take it, and the thing we need is the DOD match flag. Right. That's the hard thing to get. The comment code is just mm -hmm. for um, your convenience, but obviously not in this case. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, COD needs the DOD match flag of Y, and you're okay to process. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Sure. Mic two, ma'am. Hi, Denise Coulter, Delaware Valley University. Uh, every year I come to this conference, and by the third day I have such a head of steam that I have to come up here and tell you what I think about any of the rule changes that you've made. <laughs> this year I wanted to come up, since I always come up with bad things to say, and say how excited I am about the changes that have happened and how the collaboration has changed from years ago when it was finger pointing at the financial aid community and now I really feel like we're working collaboratively. I'd like to just say to my less seasoned financial aid professionals that are coming up behind us that this did not come without tears and fight and a lot of work on everybody's side and that it could be lost just a lot easier than it was gained. So I'm just, uh, I don't know when I'm going to, every year I've said I was going to retire, and then I come to the conference and I think, oh, this is such a good group of people, I think I'll just stay. <laughs> so, so, but I want to tell them to please volunteer and please talk to your colleagues, and together you can make things move. It will not, in this time of instant gratification. The government is not going to be 
that way. It's, I started when the, the Department of Ed had a mandate to schools that we had to have certain computers just to process our work. So it's been a long time. So I just want to let them know that it's slow moving, but it does happen, and that the profession is one of the best things that I've ever been through in my life. So. Thank you so much for those comments. There's one thing in particular that I would like to comment on. You mentioned what a wonderful group of people this is and how you don't want to retire. So Craig, <laughs> do you, I, think, I think she has a point here. <laughs> uh, if, that was a, if that was a plant. <laughs> Thanks, that was, those were nice remarks. And from the regulatory side especially, I would just like to thank Denise for her nice comments. It's, it's certainly good to hear. I think that we've worked hard on, on several recent rulemaking efforts, and, and it's good to see the positive results that are coming from those. Mike one, ma'am. Good afternoon. This is more of a suggestion. In, order, in the effort to treat all of our students who are receiving disability payments equitably, our veterans are required to report their veterans' um, disability payments on the FAFSA as other unta as untaxed income. I would recommend that we move that from question H to I under the do not include section so that they're not penalized because now they're required to port it when none of our other students are. Thank, Thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I'll check and make sure we're not mistaken, but I think that's in the statute that it, it's where it's at because it's in the law that way. Mike three, sir. Hello. So I've only been doing this for less than two years, so this might be a dumb question. Um, but for the IRS data retrieval tool, an 07 code means there's a tax amendment on file, and then we have to follow up and get the 1040X or the account transcript. But if it can detect that there is a tax amendment on file, why can't it just transfer the information? <laughs> Excellent question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> If you hadn't told me, I would never have guessed you're only in your second year. Thank you. Um, so we had to build that solution, um, the comment code of seven, based on the limitations within the IRS system. They store uh, only the original tax return information in the system that we are pulling the data from. Uh, my understanding is that uh, an amended return doesn't result in a replacement of all the data with the new values. If we were to create a solution that pulled from, assuming that there's some other database that you could get amended data from, that if we were to pull from there, we wouldn't be able to get all of the information. It's only what changed. Um, and that's why we created the solution we did, so at least we could pull something in, because in some cases, what changed isn't even uh, something that's reported on the fact. Um, and in other cases, you know, maybe one thing changed, but everything else is accurate. So prior to you starting your financial aid career, we actually had a filtering question where people would self-identify that they had amended their return, and then we wouldn't even let them use the DRT. So this was something that we did to try to make things easier for that category of people, primarily because a lot of them were self-reporting incorrectly. They hadn't actually amended their returns, and so they were taking themselves out of the... Um, you know, the running for, uh, you know, being qualified to use the IRS data retrieval tool. So it's the best solution that we were able to come up with based on all of the challenges. All right, sweet. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Mike too, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Fitzsimmons. I'm from Brookdale Community College in Lincroft, New Jersey. I have a suggestion, but before I make it, I, uh, and it's probably one you have heard before, but I just wanted to say that um, I've been in financial aid uh, so long that when I started, the Department of Education was doing verification, not schools. So that did happen a long time ago. Um, I also um, want to offer my condolences on the loss of your uh, financial aid family because I know being in financial aid so long that we are family, that we're a very connected group of people, whether we know each other or not. We understand each other and appreciate what we all do for students. So I wanted to say that. So now the suggestion. Um, in your plight to reduce the verification burden on students, 
from a community college perspective and perhaps other institutions, we have students who come to Brookdale and they choose to transfer either in the middle of the semester or uh, after receiving their associate's degree moving on to uh, their bachelor's. Um, they have to add a school to their FAFSA so that the school that they choose to attend can get their FAFSA. They were never selected for verification. It's uh, December 5th. Students um, are going to finish the semester at about December 19th. They send out their application, their FAFSA, they update their school, and it comes back selected. Oh my God. So at the end of the term, we are trying to reach out to these students who are about finished to say, your, ver your file has been selected for verification. We're going to have to send your money back if you don't verify your file now. So my question or suggestion is that if a student is just adding a school or changing their address or, you know, students, families like to get on that FAFSA and change things and do things like, oh, that's not my um, phone number anymore. I'm going to change my phone number. Is there a way to identify that there is the three things that you mentioned earlier, no risk, uh, no ra not put them in that random selection and whatever the third one is so that they're not burdened by this requirement after the term is practically over that they now have to verify their file. Okay. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you for that. I, I, you know, my answer would be in the, in the old method of, of selecting for verification, some of these date transactions mattered and we, we saw there were, there were higher instances of error depending on what people did and when, not just what they did, like at a school, but when they did it. Um, but, uh, and I don't know if Ed is still sitting over here or not, but I, I feel pretty confident that the kind of scenario that, you'll, uh, that you're describing, if that's not relevant and if it's not result, you know, the machine learning model method, I think, will detect if that kind of behavior or activity is not significant and is not contributing to improper payments, my guess is that that incidence would drop, but Ed could speak to that. Yeah, I can definitely. That's a really good suggestion. I was sitting there as you spoke and nodding my head. I'll take that back to the person who has developed the machine learning model and see if there's any way that we can adjust the model to account for exactly what what um, what you described. Thank you. Thanks. Mike, one, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Um, Cynthia, I was really pleased to hear your opening comments about more clarity about foreign gifts. We're very concerned about this, as you might imagine. Uh, we believe we were doing it right. Now we're feeling like maybe we weren't. So um, what I'd like to ask is to make sure that the clarity covers both the tuition and foreign payments for education for our students, if that needs to be included to what level. Um, foundations, I'm concerned about because we have very little control over these independent foundations, so I'd like clarity on that. And I know the comments are still under consideration. We submitted some from our institution, and I know there have been a lot of associations that have also done so. I don't know why I'm so trembly. But yet I heard that you're going forward with the reporting tool and that you expect it to be live within a couple of weeks of the January 31st deadline. I'm really concerned about assembling and getting the information into you in that short period. So I hope that there will be also some consideration about us learning your new tool to make sure that our data is accurate and if we can't make that in the two week period, maybe we have some, you know, leeway for this first time. That's my request. Thank you, and we will definitely take those suggestions back to the department. Thank you. Mike too, sir. In the uh, financial aid tab of College Navigator, there are two tables, one for first time students, the other for all undergraduate students. They used to have the same set of columns, but the percentage receiving aid silently disappeared for the second set of tables. Uh, and students and parents find that extremely useful to have that column there. I can't exactly refer them to the iPads data tables and tell them, look up uh, the, this particular database uh, and 
find the OPID and then find the college for this column and then divide A by B and get the result. So uh, I, I'd like to suggest restoring that column. The data is still there. It just disappeared from the interface. And uh, the second thing is I'd like to compliment all of you on your choice of music this conference. <laughs> it's been great. Yeah. Mike three, ma'am. Thank you. I just want to give compliments, OK? Um, I will admit that I am challenged when it comes to a computer. It's enough that I turn it on and it's connected to a printer. But I will tell you that I used, I went to visit the resource room and um, the FAFSA demo, the new product that's coming out that's going to combine everything and anything for student loans. And the people there were tremendously um, helpful and patient with someone who has challenging questions. Carol Gar Cargo, Daniel Gonzalez, and Thomas, I know I'm screwing up the name, Mascardo, who doesn't work for the department, but was very, very patient. And so I just want to say thank you and keep it up. Thank you for those uh, thank yous, ma'am. Uh, Mike, one, please. Hi, Ashley Bergman, Marquette University. I have some items about the informed borrowing tool. Um, could you put on there somewhere that this isn't a bill for the <laughs> in-school students, especially? Because they might see it and think, you know. Um, and in the make a payment, could you have make a payment for those in-school students for interest only uh, allowed there? So you're asking if, um, well, we will definitely uh, do our best to make sure we have good plain language on the tool so that we do not add confusion to it. Um, are you asking for make a payment to be uh, also associated with the tool itself? Isn't it in the tool? The make it's in student, it will be on studentaid.gov. Oh, okay. But yes, but the borrowers in will be able to make a payment um, with a future release. Okay. Um, and then just overall, I think there people have a lot of confusion about they take out a loan and then once they go into repayment, it's capitalized. So if there could be some additional information put on that tool about how, you know, this, you may have taken out a $10,000 loan, but all your interest that's accruing, it's going to become a bigger loan. Okay. Uh, and our Q&As will have that information in it, but we will attempt to, to make it clearer. Thank you. Mike three, ma'am. Hi there. So today I heard something that was really exciting and hopefully can, can be expanded. So I was um, in the cybersecurity session where they talked about the fact that you guys are going through your review of the PPA right now and that specifically with regard to cybersecurity requirements that you're looking at potentially having tiers. Uh, you know, like a bigger school might have more requirements, whereas a uh, five-computer barbershop school might only have, would have much less requirements. I think that's a great and, and so thankful for the thought process on that. I would ask if we can use that to take the next step about segregating out schools. Um, and you know, I work with proprietary schools. So small family-owned proprietary schools are much different than uh, equity-owned or publicly held uh, schools. And the one place where they're significantly different and which I think you're trying to adjust through accreditation, uh, uh, NEGREG, is, the, is right around mission. So a school that's family-owned has one mission for the school. It is the school's mission. It's the one they're held accountable to for accreditors. When you're held by a publicly held company or you're held by private equity company, you have the school mission and then the investor mission. 
So it's a layering of multiple missions. And for the school, it's, it's trying to please two masters, if you will. But I think that could be a place, potentially, where we could start to, to segregate out our small family-owned schools that for 30, 40 years, that's been their whole life. And, and they're lumped into uh, this uh, a bigger group that, and they, they all have different motivations, I think. So thank you for your suggestion about the tiers, and um, we will take that back, but thank you so much for that feedback. It's, it's good to know that you guys are appreciative of that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Mike, too, ma'am. Hi, I'm Desiree. I'm with Bryant and Stratton College. I had a question on uh, the statement of educational purpose as it uh, pertains to the verification tracking groups. Sometimes for our online students, it's challenging to be able to access a notary um, or, to, or they're not close to a campus footprint to be able to satisfy that. I wasn't sure if there was any uh, consideration or another way of doing it that has been considered. Yeah, we had this question, I think, was it yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Um, we, we have looked over time at online uh, notary uh, options, and, and I, I, quite honestly, I, I don't know that we're opposed to pursuing that. We just didn't have uh, a whole lot of demand or need for it. So we, we'll, we'll, we aren't done thinking about that. I mean, I think if there's a need, um, we would continue to, to, to explore uh, providing that kind of an alternative. I think the context, now that I think about it, was within the... Wasn't it a military deployment, somebody that was deployed overseas and didn't have access to a notary uh, in their deployment? So we'll take that back. It's, it's, it's certainly uh, an issue that we've, we've discussed on and off for the last year or so. I appreciate that. Would you also consider um, how a student is able to walk into a campus and get it done by a school official? From an online perspective, would you allow maybe um, kind of a video chat or a Skype where the student is holding up their ID, you're able to kind of screenshot that for documentation. Mm -hmm. Would that be something that you, you would consider? Yeah, we also we also had those conversations with identity verification and and allowing uh, other alternatives. It gets it gets uh, you know as you can imagine, it gets a little tricky. We want to be careful that we're not introducing the opportunity for fraud. But, Absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, that it, we've 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 considered both of those. Thank you, Mike. One. Ma'am? Hi, I'm Annie Fuller from Folsom Lake College. Um, this is again about the homeless students. So I have the AVG up in front of me, and there is a section that says um, the student can still be considered homeless if they're living in a dormitory, and if they had to leave the dormitory, they would have no place to go. But there's a lot of schools like ours that don't have dormitories. So I think the intent of the law was they are having a place to stay based on the fact that they receive aid so they can stay in the dormitory. So we have a lot of students that they're only in a room, renting a room because they receive aid. It was just a thought of maybe including those populations and our types of colleges in this language. Yeah, yeah thank you for that. I don't, I, I, I could, my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's because they're receiving aid. I think it's because they're in housing that's considered le uh, not permanent because it's associated with their enrollment in the school. That's, that's the dormitory reference. So maybe then we need more, I need more training on, I have students that I've met consecutive years, years excuse me, that would have been homeless. We determined that they were. They started receiving aid. They were able to pay for a room to rent, and they've been progressing in college. So then when I meet them a consecutive year, they seem to have a permanent stable residence, but I know the minute they don't receive aid, they're going to be on the street again. Yeah, and I, th so. and I think we do reference. I've got Kira Mosley-Hobbs coming up to the mic, and she's our subject matter expert on that. But I do think we talk about homeless or at risk of homeless, yes. being homeless, yes. and maybe that's part of it. But she can better address that. Correct. So the requirement for a homeless student is unaccompanied homeless or at risk of homeless. And so you have some leeway when it comes to the risk factor of it. Like he said before, it's about not having permanent housing. And we kind of leave that to you to do the case-by-case -case review and figure out if that student is at risk of homeless. Because sometimes you can look at that in the general fact that anyone 
working two jobs and low income is technically only paying their rent because some income is coming in at that moment. But if you look at that student and you determine that there's a serious risk of homelessness and there's no permanent housing other than the three months of Title IV aid they can, you can make that call and consider that student unaccompanied homeless youth. And thank you. And I know that this session or this um, conference didn't have someone from uh, the homeless uh, liaison for the Department of Education, but a couple of years ago, you did have a session on that, and it was really, really helpful because I think that's a growing population that we're seeing. Correct. I've heard from a, a few institutions so far at the conference that they see their population growing and have a concern for it. So we're de uh, definitely taking that back with us and looking at it for future conferences about bringing it back. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kira. Mike three, ma'am. Hi, I'm Heather uh, from Honolulu Community College, and I have a question or if you can give me some advice on we have some very rural areas and some um, schools that have very weird internet kind of setups. And we get a lot of glitches on when we're trying to do a FAFSA, getting kicked off like in the middle of the session, or when we complete it, we submit it, there's no confirmation pages, things like that. Do you, do, am, are we the only place that has that problem? <laughs> and I know I'm from Hawaii, but. Yeah, so whether you're using the website or the mobile app, I mean, it does rely on you having a connection to the internet. Um, we have heard of instances, uh, are you talking specifically about people not seeing the confirmation page or having difficulty actually submitting the FAFSA because they can't kind maintain of, a connection? Kind of all around, um, getting kicked out in the middle of doing mm -hmm. an app, getting to the end and not seeing the submission or seeing the confirmation page, kind of a little of both. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm not really sure what we could do to help with that because it does require, when you're doing something online, it requires you to maintain um, a connection. Um, if somebody successfully submits and doesn't see the confirmation page, um, as long as they provided an email address, they will still receive um, not the exact version of the confirmation page, but at least the same general information, like what their EFC is and their DRN and that sort of thing. We automatically email it to them. Um, and then, of course, you know, they would receive the student aid report. That's something that they would be able to also uh, see that information on. Um, I mean, I'm not... Well, that's required. I mean, the, one of the purposes of the save key is to allow people to, um, you know, who lose a connection, uh, to be able to return to that form and not have lost their data. Uh, so hopefully, um, you know, that is at least uh, resulting in people not having to start over from scratch. But I, I appreciate the feedback, and I, I doubt that you're the only one. I know that in years past, um, you know, I had heard uh, that uh, some of the schools in Puerto Rico had some difficulty, um, and I'm sure that there are other areas where, you know, the um, internet connections are not quite as good as they are in, in other areas. But um, aside from saying people should fill out a paper FAFSA, which I would never want to say, I'm not sure what we would be able to do. It's not, um, it's not an issue with our site, it's an issue with the connection to our site, and that's not something that we can be responsible for ourselves. It's, it, you know, it a connection is, you know, two sides. So um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how I can help you. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Mike one, sir. Uh, yes, I'm just looking for an update. Uh, last year, there was some discussion about being able to use the DRT for verification of non-filing status. Uh, hoping there's an update this year. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, that, uh, in fact, there was even an, I think there was an article in the Washington Post even this morning about some potential legislation that's being considered that would uh, permit uh, a more sharing of uh, IRS data with the FAFSA. Um, and I don't know, I can't really go into a whole lot more detail, but I do believe that uh, having that uh, access would include uh, confirmation and non-filing as well. So stay tuned. Thank you. 
Go ahead. I was just going to say, in the meantime, you know, we were um, going down a path. I actually announced at a conference a few years ago that we were implementing a change that would allow for that confirmation to come from the IRS. Uh, but subsequent to my making that announcement, um, we learned from the IRS that that wasn't actually something that we could pursue. I believe that was the same year that we also started encrypting the data so that students and parents can't even see what comes from the IRS. So um, our, our primary issue is all of the rules around how to properly authenticate that somebody is the right person, um, you know, considering, you know, the potential for fraud and, and you know, all of that other stuff, you know, wrap that all up into, you know, we want to create um, uh, a, a situation where we're very, very confident that the person who is requesting the data is the person, you know, that the data belongs to, um, and that they're uh, obtaining it for the, the purposes that it's intended for. Using the IRS data retrieval tool, the purpose is for us to be able to properly determine their eligibility for aid. Um, what you're t asking about specifically is not retrieving um, data it would be nothing more than being able to confirm that there isn't actually a tax return on file, um, and we can't establish the appropriate level of authentication um, based on the current rules uh, that are in effect. Um, for a change such as the one that Craig referenced would potentially um, you know, allow for a different outcome there, but not without some sort of legislative change. So, so in regards to verifying that that is who the person is, if they're at the point that they can use the DRT, they've created and hopefully verified an FSD. Uh, so. it, it's, not, it's not us verifying, it's the IRS verifying. And their, ver their rules for authentication are very complex, um, but if, a ta if there is no tax return on file, it's much harder for them to verify somebody because they don't exist in their system. And that's basically what creates the problem. If they have a tax return, then they can, somebody can authenticate with the IRS because they have information that matches what's at the IRS. If the IRS doesn't have something, then what are you matching against? And that basically is what creates the problem. And I would just add, we, we were moving forward with, as you know, with uh, IRS DRT confirming non-filing, and then we had, you recall, it was in the, in the popular media, some, uh, knowing who did not, who has not yet filed a tax return uh, was, was uh, an important bit of information that could be used by fraudsters to file fraudulent tax returns, and so that all kind of uh, got put on hold. And that's why we, we, we unfortunately had to go to plan B, which was the verification of non-filing from the IRS, and we're still working our way back. But I, like I said, this legislative uh, initiative, if it does come to pass, and you'll, you'll just read it in the newspaper like the rest of us, uh, I think would, would go a long way to, to addressing what you're asking. Thank you. We have time for three more questions. Uh, Mike, too. Joan Zanders, Northern Virginia Community College. Uh, all of the technology and innovation that's been introduced at this conference is very, very exciting. I have noticed, however, that much of it is based on NSLDS, which is neither direct update or even a timely update. It is not live information. Can you give us any idea when we might expect a 21st century database? Um, thank you for your question and concern. I think um, at the conference we've been talking about how we are technically moving forward with all of our systems. So as we uh, build our PPO, next gen PPO solution, and as we uh, continue to move forward, we will be addressing just those types of issues that we hear. Uh, as you know, the data that's stored in NSLDS is reported from many, many sources. And as we move into how we can address that in the future, we will hopefully be able to get data more timely, even more timely than we do from some of the, the places we get it today. But we will be addressing all those types of things. It's just a concern because students are going to be looking at their studentaid.gov and not saying real-time information when they may have had an interaction in the last few days that still hasn't been updated. And the goal is to get the data from our servicers uh, much more frequently or even real time at some point. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Mike three, ma'am. 
Hi, Brandy from um, Bellevue, Florida. Um, I just had a, a, when the informed borrower tool came out, I thought this is great for Florida because they had recently passed a statute back in 2017 where if the post-secondary institution was participating in the state grant program, that they are required to send out an annual disclosure to the students informing them of their federal student loans and various factors um, in order to participate in this state grant program. And I think that is to just raise student awareness. So the informed borrowed tool seems to be uh, providing the same information and has to be done on an annual basis, is this something that the Florida schools would then need to lobby at the state level to, um, I guess, negate the requirement of the institutions to provide this information um, to the students to satisfy that state statute? Or will the federal government be issuing that this is now going to be requirement for students that are receiving federal loans? Um, and we've started having some discussions. Uh, as you know, each state probably uh, has different rules and regulations around that, the, the debt letter or whatever it's called in each area. Sometimes, and many often require private loans um, or loans that we, do, we would not ha be able to supply back on the informed borrower tool. So we will attempt to pull together as much as we can on the different requirements around the states and then see how we can use the informed borrower tool or, or have the states use the informed borrower tool, but we've just started uh, get, uh, having discussions on that. Uh, we would also like to collect information from the folks here on what, they, what the schools do at each state so that we can uh, have a better discussion. So uh, I'd like to give everyone an email um, that he's going to be collecting the information from us from our, for our policy area. His name's Michael Ruglis, which is spelled R-U-G-G-L-E-S-S -S at ed.gov. So we would like to start collecting a lot of the information on that if possible. Please. Yeah, that would be great because as far, um, just reading over the, the thing from Dep uh, Florida Department of Education, it, it does deal with the, just the federal direct loans and it would seem like that that has the same information. And uh, one more thing about the informed borrow tool, because it re has all of that information in there and the students are doing it on an annual basis, would this then in the future alleviate the requirement for exit counseling or can information that may be in exit counseling that is not in the informed borrow tool be added to then satisfy that requirement? We can take that back, but right now we will be leaving exit counseling, um, but we can take back to see if there's a way that we can help integrate the two. Thank you. Final question, Mike Two. Yeah, hi, I, I'd just like to follow up with uh, Heather's question. I'm also from Hawaii, and I'd like to revisit that glitch that we're finding. I hope it's not just us in Hawaii, but I can say that it's not due to um, you know, a faulty internet connection because it's happening in my financial aid office often, especially during the FAFSA nights and when it's heavy load volume, but um, periodically as well. And so it's really frustrating. It happens sometimes in the middle of the application. Most often when they hit submit, it kicks them out. We know, we found out that it's actually being submitted, but it's just leaving an unknown. And so we have to then tell them, look it, we know it's been submitted. Um, okay. Right. But sometimes it happens in the middle of the application too, which causes them to go all over again. So, so thank that, you, thank you for clarifying that. That actually sounds more like an issue that we've heard reported, um, not just from Hawaii, but from um, uh, schools that are uh, typically hosting uh, completion events where they're using equipment, you know, within their own uh, institution or whatever, um, and will sometimes encounter issues with firewalls. And we put some guidance out. You can find it on the financial aid toolkit. And I believe we also posted it on IFAP um, that provides the uh, guidance for how the, your IT department can uh, make sure that that's not happening. Um, we hear a lot of feedback related to those events about the 
confirmation page not displaying, and also about some of the options on the confirmation page um, that that are not working. If the if the page does display that the functions maybe are not working, I did hear a trick from uh, somebody on Monday. I think uh, he was telling me that um, someone accidentally discovered that if they encounter that issue where the confirmation page doesn't display, it's like grayed out and then it has like a box or something in front of it, that if you tap on the gray area and hit escape twice, that the confirmation page miraculously displays. So I'm just throwing that out there in the event it, you know you want to you want to test it out. But I would go to the financial aid toolkit site and look for that guidance because it may be a firewall issue that you're actually experiencing. So, so is this the same as when they first log in and they get the error page saying that you have to have certain versions of depending on the browser? Because I get that as well, and that might be what you're talking about, but. No, that's not what I'm talking okay. about. So then, okay, so. Yeah, what, that sounds completely different. We do have uh, certain requirements for browser versions. Yeah. So is it possible, so are, are people using your equipment at your school to do this? Both, ours and at the high schools, yeah. So. That browser issue is separate, so I wanted to make sure that you... you yeah, that, that separate sounds too. separate. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, we posted guidance. We first heard about the issue last year um, because it wasn't happening until we made the website mobile responsive. Um, and so we started hearing about it at the... Um, in the October-ish time frame last year, we posted some guidance. And then this year, it was shortly after launch, we started to hear it again. And so we reissued the same guidance to make sure that it was you know, easier to find. So you shouldn't have too hard of a time finding it on the Financial Aid Toolkit site. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Please give our panel members a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for your questions, comments, and recommendations. And enjoy the rest of your day.